I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend quite a lot of time in, in kind of uh, expressing a formalism to deal with trees that kind of tries to be a, a what we see as a natural generalization from string to trees, okay? So, and so all the, the model I will describe uh, is in the form of a tree automata and then that's going to have a particular instantiation to say a grammar. By grammar I mean something that we use for parsing, okay? So, uh, in the last recent years, as you can, so there's some, this, this is some uh, work, but it's not just work, it's very recent work, all of it, uh, using uh, spectral learning methods for dealing with trees, okay? From more theoretical uh, work by Bailly and collaborators to an application that you may be familiar uh, by Shai Cohen and others to learning uh, latent annotated uh, context-free grammars. There's been also applications to syntactic dependency parsing, and there's been uh, also some applications to unsupervised learning of grammars. And in this conference, we have a very nice paper that uh, deals with synchronous grammars for translation, okay? Where they uh, learn some sort, of, it can be seen as an extension of this work in the sense that they, they define a synchronous grammar and they learn a latent variable process for that grammar, okay? Which we yields uh, very nice results and it's a very, it's a very nice application of, of these ideas, okay? So I will try to show the framework of three automatas just to give uh, an idea of uh, how to how design uh, methods like that, okay? So we're not gonna go uh, to, to a point where we can actually understand these contributions, okay? We're gonna be a, at a more general, uh, I, I will have a more, a more general disc discussion, okay? So. The general discussion is the same idea of some desiderata, okay? So now our objects, we're gonna be trees, okay? And we want a function over trees that computes things, okay? And we want this function to be compositional, okay? So what's gonna be compositional, okay? So we, if we have a structure, it seems that we can think of a cut, okay? So I can, I can, I can divide uh, this tree into this lower tree and this uh, uh, upper tree, okay? In two parts, okay? So by a compositional function, we mean that this f needs to be expressed as the inner product between some function that takes this upper tree and computes some uh, n-dimensional vector that summarizes that upper tree times uh, a beta function that takes the lower tree and computes an n-dimensional representation, okay? And we want that our function, will be, our function be the inner product of uh, these two vectors, okay, of which ahead of time we don't know the space, okay, but by composition we mean uh, one ingredient of compositional is that this happens, okay. The other ingredient is that because we have many places in which we can cut a tree into two, okay, or even into three, okay, so the same idea should happen. We want that our function behaves the same irrespectively of where we place the cut, okay? So if we do a cut such that we isolate a node here, we have this upper tree, so we want our function, as before, to compute uh, an n-dimensional vector summarizing this tree. Uh, then this, uh, this here gets uh, slightly more complicated than before. So then we have two other bottom trees here, okay? So we have uh, n-dimensional representations of these two trees here. Then we have some cross product. I will be more specific about that. And then we have uh, a matrix uh, related to the node here that kind of puts these uh, things together and completes our computation, okay? So, and of course I could select any other place where I can cut my trees into two or three parts, okay? So what I want is to uh, deal with uh, a, mo a class of functions that has these properties. And uh, what I'm gonna do is, as before, is to take advantage of uh, spectral techniques in order to identify the, the n-dimensional spaces where these two functions operate, and that will serve me to then isolate the, the, the parameters of my automata, my tree automata, in the form of matrices, okay? So that's the general high-level concept, okay? So in all that I'm doing here, I'm trying actually to work with this notion of cut, okay? So 
what, what I need to do in order to have a story that not only follows from strings to trees is to have a notion of a generalization of concatenation. Okay? In, st in strings, uh, I have this operation, the concatenation, that takes a prefix and a suffix and builds uh, a full string. Okay? Here, I will have uh, the same notion of operation, which I, I will just call composition. Okay? And uh, whenever uh, I have a full tree, I can understand this tree as the result of taking uh, some tree like that, that I will define later, and I will call outside tree, composed with some uh, other tree that is an inside tree. Okay? So if I take this and I, this is a substitution node, if I substitute uh, this tree here, I get the full tree. Okay? So that's, this is, this is a, a, a generalization of a concatenation uh, operation. Okay? So, so the, 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 the analogy here is that this operation generalizes concatenation and uh, these outside trees will generalize prefixes and these inside trees will generalize suffixes. Okay? So uh, by having this operation, we will apply the same type of ideas and come up with a spectral method for that. Okay? So I will describe uh, uh, weighted finite tree automata as an algebraic model of uh, compositional functions over trees. Okay? So I, I have to start by defining what is an automata, as we did before with um, a what is a tree automata, as we did before with, uh, sim with uh, normal finite state automata. My objects are going to be labeled trees. Okay? So here uh, I will define an alphabet that is partitioned into different sets according to uh, something that is the RIT. Okay? This will, I, I think it will become clear. Basically, uh, this set of symbols will be terminal symbols that appear in the leaves of the tree. This set here, sigma to the one, will be uh, symbols that appear in unary productions, binary productions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. For simplicity, we will deal with just trees with binary productions because it's just easier. Okay, and so uh, considering this uh, this set of symbols that build trees, okay, we're going to have this uh, calligraphic T as the space of all uh, label trees. Okay. This can be described as a graph which has vertices as a set of nodes and some edges that form a tree, okay? And each node will have a label uh, that is one of these labels in this alphabet. Uh, I'm more interested in uh, explaining, say, defining the space of possible trees uh, in an inductive fashion, okay? Because this inductive way of defining trees then will serve me to naturally define a function that makes computations of trees. Okay? So let's look at first at what are trees, how can I build them recursively. So uh, I have this set of terminal symbols. So if I choose a symbol in this set of terminal symbols, this is a tree. Okay? It's the simplest tree, which is just a leaf. Okay? So any, li any leaf, any terminal symbol is a tree. Okay? Uh, I can build trees by unary composition. This means that if I have, uh, for any tree, in my set, uh, if I choose a symbol in the set of unary symbols and I compose it, so I add this uh, sigma on top of this tree, I get uh, another tree. Okay? So I will note this by that. So in this case, the tree is just sigma. In this case, the tree is sigma uh, composed with T1. Okay? With T1 as is any tree. Okay? So this gives me unary branches. <laughs> And if I have symbols uh, in the bi with RIT2, okay, this will take two trees as, uh, as, uh, as inputs, eh? okay, and I can take these two trees and compose them with uh, this binary symbol, okay, and that gives me a binary branch, okay. So if I keep applying this, so I stop here with with RIT2, I could I could keep going, okay. So this can give this can build any tree that has uh, unary and binary branchings. Okay. Uh, okay. I defined what are my objects in a recursive fun function. I need also to uh, so to, we, we're going to define a model that is that uses employs vectors, matrices, tensors, and combinations of vectors. Okay. So I'm going to use this Kronecker product operation or cross product. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to define it for our purposes. So say that I have two vectors in, in the same dimensionality. This could be gen uh, defined more generally, but uh, in our case, the two vectors we combine are always in the same dimensionality. Okay? So this operation, which is uh, the cross product, gives me a vector 
with uh, n square dimensions, which contains all possible combinations, okay, all possible products. So here's a small example. If my first vector is AB and second vector is CD, the result of doing the cross product of V1 and V2 is AC, AD, BC, BD, okay? It's a square number of dimensions, okay? So our trees, in order to simplify notation, uh, we're gonna be of rt2, so that means that we're gonna basically deal with three type of uh, um, linear algebra objects. First, vectors, which say it's our base type of object, okay? Uh, and then matrices and tensors, okay? So I will take a pragmatic view of these uh, objects. I will just, we, we just can think of a matrix as some object that takes one vector and produces another vector, okay? So the product of this matrix with a vector gives me another vector in, in Rn, okay? So just this, uh, this superscript tells me the, how many arguments this is expecting, okay? So a normal matrix is something that expects one vector and produces one vector, okay? And I will think of a tensor as a matrix that uh, maps two vectors, n square, to one vector, okay? So it takes two vectors and produces another vector, and this is by uh, taking the cross product, as we define it here, of uh, these two input vectors, times this matrix will produce another vector, okay? By just, so, and this, these are linear maps, okay? So this is a linear map for the vector, and this is a linear map in the space of all combinations, okay? So we'll just take this pragmatic view. We don't need to go deeper into the notion of matrices and tensors and that. We will just uh, think about that as something that take one or two vectors and then produce another vector, okay? And that's gonna be useful to define the grammar, which uh, here it comes, okay? Okay, so, uh, so we have some alphabet restricted to R82. A grammar is a tuple that has uh, initial weights, that has a vector for each uh, symbol. Okay, so it has, it has the root weights. It works in an n-dimensional space. It, it has uh, a vector of root weights. We'll see how this works. For each leaf ter terminal symbol, it has a vector of parameters. Then for each uh, node of RIT1, it has one matrix. And for each node of RIT2, it has a, this kind of tensor, okay? Let's see how this works, okay? Now is where I, by following the, the inductive definition of trees I used before, I will associate uh, a process that computes a function and mimics the way that works, okay? So, I will, I will start by defining what we call the inside function, okay? Um, so it's a function beta a that takes a tree and produces vector in Rn, okay? So there are three cases. If my tree is just a terminal symbol, I will take that the function on this tree is just the vector associated to that symbol, okay? That is this case, okay? So in this case, it's the base case is just a vector, okay? In the case that my tree is built by a unary composition of uh, a unary symbol with another tree, then <coughs> the vector associated to this tree is taking uh, the inside vector of this inner tree, the, in the vector associated to this, times the matrix associated to this unary symbol, okay? So here's when we see that we have a vector and we have this matrix that takes a vector and kind of maps it to another vector that is kind of the, the transformation we do after adding this unary production, okay? And here's where uh, the cross product comes, okay? So if we have a tree that is built by combining two existing trees with a binary production, okay? We're gonna take the inside vector of each of the two trees, do the cross product, and then the tensor associated with this node will turn this combination in back into a vector, okay? So it's kind of updating the vector form to include this unary production, okay? So by this recursive function, I can map any tree to an n-dimensional vector, okay? Which we call the inside vector, okay? So what is the function that my tree automata computes, okay? So I can say that every tree automata A defines a function that maps trees to now scalars. That's the final uh, value computed by the function by just taking the inside vector of this tree and uh, times the root weights associated with the grammar. 
Okay, that, so this will uh, then turn the inside vector into a scalar, okay, by just an inner product, okay? So we can see the example of how things uh, run here. Say we have this tree, okay, so we, the computation goes bottom up as the inside algorithm. This mimics the inside algorithm for those of you who are familiar. Okay, so at every, uh, at every leaf, our model, our gram, our tree automata has a vector for each leaf. Then we go up, okay, so this, is, this will be the, arg so here we have a matrix and this is just the argument to this, this is another vector. And so th this node has associated a tensor uh, that expects two vectors that just come from children, okay, we just respect the order. And so um, this has associated a tensor that takes the two children, uh, the, the result of the two children as, uh, as inputs, okay? So we have that this is a vector that kind of summarizes bottom up, summarizes uh, all this tree into a vector, okay? So if we do the product of this with the root weights, we get the, the, the score, the prediction of our model for this tree. So as before, we can think of this uh, weighted uh, tree automata as a function that, as a model, as a latent variable model that, that uh, takes trees and produces uh, and predicts the scores, okay? So in this case, we're gonna think of an existing tree and we're gonna think of a process that for each node in the tree associates some uh, latent variable in, the, in this number of states, okay? So the computation we just saw is equivalent to uh, thinking that given the tree, we, we assign each of the nodes one of one value of the, of the hidden state, okay? And then we have, we have a model that can uh, evaluate uh, the tree annotated with hidden states, and then we do a sum of our possible ways to annotate the tree with, with hidden states, okay? So all this, all this uh, all this computation is what is done recursively with that, okay? So because of this, analogous to uh, the first part, we can think of BA, the, the inside function of a tree, as something that computes features, okay? It computes the features of a tree in a compositional fashion, and then our model is just an inner product in this space, okay? So we can, uh, this is the explicit form of the inner product, okay? So this would be, the weights of our model, and this would be the features of our tree. Again, insisting that it has a nice property that this feature vector is compositional. It can be updated in a recursive function fashion. Okay, so now uh, I just showed how we, I can define a model that computes scores on a tree, okay? But there's a little bit more. Um, that computation uh, can happen not with, not with just the inside computation I, I showed, but it, we, can, we can see the same computation in different places, okay? And uh, to do that, I need to define this notion of outside trees, okay? So, uh, okay, so one uh, intuition is that if I have one full tree, say, and I pick one node, I can distinguish between the subtree of that, uh, at that node, which includes the node itself, okay? So I'm gonna call this an inside tree even though inside trees are trees, okay? Because they, they have the same form, okay? And then the rest of the tree, if I remove this subtree, it's gonna be something I call an outside tree, okay? So this outside tree now, instead of the node V, it has this special node marked with a star, which can be thought of as a footnote if you want. Uh, it's not a, uh, uh, in tree-adjoining grammars, we, we talk about footnotes. Uh, we, we think of this as an insertion, uh, as a node that is an insertion, okay? So I'm gonna call capital T sub star the space of outside trees, okay? So uh, in essence, uh, what is an outside tree? An outside tree is a tree that has exactly one leaf that is the food node, okay? So an outside tree always has uh, one food node and exactly one, okay? So this will be, uh, a uh, new object, okay, that appears whenever we generalize from strings to, to trees. Uh, why do I want 
this notion of outside tree because I want a composition operation that takes two arguments and produces a tree, okay? So uh, in this case, uh, this composition operation takes an inside tree and an outside tree, okay? And if I just substitute, I get a full tree, okay? So this is really the generalization of prefix and suffix uh, concatenation in strings, even though in the string case, we don't think as the prefix being of different nature as the suffix, they are both strings and concatenating them uh, generates a string. Here we have to define uh, a slightly different tree in the, in the prefix part, okay? So it's clear that if I have one tree, I have many multiple ways to decompose it into inside outside, okay? Namely, as many as number of nodes, okay? Any, any node in the tree, I can do a, an inside outside uh, composition or decomposition, okay? So I'm gonna define uh, what are outside trees analogously to what I did before for inside trees in a recursive inductive function fashion. And that that's gets a little bit more tricky because I have to define a space of trees where the trees always have one and exactly one uh, leaf, okay? But why, what I, why I'm doing that? I'm doing that because defining the trees in this fashion will then allow me to, assign, uh, to, to then define a, a computational process that assigns vectors to, to any outside tree, okay? And that's gonna be useful in order to have these inside-outside uh, functions that map inside or outside trees to vectors, okay? So here's how we go. Um, it's similar to before, okay? So the, the base case is that a foot node itself is, a, is the base outside tree. Now, uh, if I take an existing outside tree, which I plot by doing something like that, it's a tree with a hole, okay, with a substitution node, so I, take, I have an, out, an outside tree, and I take a unity symbol in my alphabet, okay? So I do as follows. First, I take this uh, unity symbol, and I construct this, this small tree by uh, putting the food node, okay? So that gives me a tree with a food node, and then I substitute this small tree here, okay? So then this tree, this outside tree, has been augmented with a sigma symbol while keeping the footnote, okay? So I can, the notation is not important because it's not gonna be necessary to understand this notation to follow, but I can build uh, an outside tree by composing an existing outside tree with uh, a tree that is built by composing sigma with a footnote, okay? And then I can do the analogous with binary compositions, okay? And because a binary composition takes uh, two trees, so I have two ways, I, th I have two places where to put the food node. There has to be one food node and exactly one, okay? So I can, uh, I can have one existing outside tree and then one existing inside tree and a, a binary node, and I can build this tree by composing the food node on the left side with the inside node, okay? And then I uh, compose this inside tree with the outside, okay? So that gives me a bigger, uh, outside tree that has this binary production here with the food node waiting, okay? And I can do the analogous on the left side, okay? Okay, so now I'm gonna define uh, a process that assigns, uh, it's an, uh, what we call the outside function that takes an outside tree and computes uh, an outside vector, okay? So if my outside tree is just the food node, then my outside vector is just the root, uh, the root, the vector of root weights of my automata, okay? And directly the parameters. If my outside tree results from composing an outside tree with uh, a unary production, then uh, this is basically taking the matrix associated to this node and, and kind of uh, doing this product of the outside vector of the outside tree with this matrix, okay? And now, whenever my outside tree results from a binary composition, this takes, this is a bit of an algebraic tr a trick, which uh, took me a while to convince myself that this uh, makes it, but this in part what we, what is nice about employing linear, linear algebra, that there are compact equations to express 
things naturally, so maybe it's gonna be hard to digest this equation here in real time, but it's what it does, okay? So if we, has, if we have uh, a tree, an outside tree that results from this binary composition, okay? So we have, we obtain the vector of, uh, after this operation by taking the vector of the initial outside tree times this tensor matrix associated to my symbol. And then here's where the tree comes, okay? I take the inside tree associated to this uh, tree here, and I do cross product with a vector of ones of the same dimensionality, okay? So uh, this cross, cross product times all this will give me a, no a vector that stands for what we, thi what we want, okay? Which is a vector that summarizes that, okay? And there's a similar expression for when uh, we do a left, uh, the other side of binary production, okay, which basically takes this uh, vector and puts it on the other side, okay? So yeah, maybe one needs to work a little bit this equation to convince that that's what we want, but it, it is, okay? Uh, so why do I define this? Because by having this definition of inside and outside function, now I realize that my uh, tree automata is fully compositional, okay? What would, do we mean by that? That if I have a tree for any, pl any node where I do an inside outside uh, decomposition, I have that the function that my tree automata computes on the full tree is equal to the inside vector of the outside tree times, sorry, the outside vector of the outside tree times the inside vector of the inside tree, okay? So it's, it's this uh, notion, this generalized notion of uh, a string concatenation. With a string concatenation, any, any way we have to decompose a string into a prefix and a suffix, then we can associate the forward and backward vectors and do the new product. So here's analogous with the inside-outside decomposition, okay? So we have the outside process generates a vector, the inside process generates a vector, and the inner product of that um, is the function of my tree, okay? So the, the, the spectral algorithm will come that if we have examples of trees and we break them in different ways, from this uh, composition operation, we kind of isolate this, the 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 vector spaces in which these two functions operate, okay, by doing factorizations, okay? And then, because we can move the decomposition by leaving one node in the middle, okay, so now I have that, I can turn this tree into an outside tree, an isolated node, and two inside trees, okay? An equation like this uh, follows, okay? So now I have that, I have uh, the value on, of this function on this tree as a function of uh, inside and outside vectors times the parameters associated to this node of the grammar, okay? So this will allow me, analogous to before, to isolate the parameters and then, and so learn the, the automata, okay? Uh, so once we have these kind of equations, we're gonna proceed as we did before, okay? Uh, we're gonna consider the Hankel representation of our function that we want to learn, okay? So I, since uh, up to now I described the functional uh, form of our tree automata, okay? Uh, we can have uh, our function expressed as a mat in matrix form. Uh, we, let's think of the conceptual uh, Hankel matrix that is infinite times infinite. Before it was indexed by prefixes and suffixes, now it's gonna be indexed by any possible outside tree times any possible inside tree, okay? Uh, the value you can guess, so the value, the entry at, uh, for an outside tree and inside tree is the value of the function when composing these two, okay? And we're gonna be interested in, uh, so this will allow us by some factorization to isolate the inside-outside maps, okay? And in order to extract the, the operators of the grammar, we're gonna be interested in subblocks for each symbol, okay? So, so the subblock for a symbol is the entries uh, corresponding to one outside vector and then inside vectors that are, are always headed by the symbol, okay? So, so we will always have this sigma on top of each inside tree, okay? In order to do what, sorry? 
uh, inside trees having a food node. Um, but with 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 you are you are trying to define an alternative uh, to the composition. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so the inside tree is a tree. The the space of inside trees is also the space of trees. So you could think that the inside tree is, as a matter of fact, built by composing, which, uh, which as a matter of fact it is. Okay. Uh, so I choose to break here, but I, but then so you could see this inside tree, yeah, as composing this part with this part. Uh, yeah, if that was your full tree, uh, yeah, that intuition is 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 valid. Uh, you can you, uh, any tree you can anywhere turn it into an inside and an outside. Okay, what we want is to uh, to build a tree by kind of composing two objects. Okay, so any edge will be one place where you can cut the tree. So precisely this way of cutting into it is what allows us to organize our trees or functions in the form of a matrix. Okay, uh, so it has the same properties as before. It's highly redundant. Okay. And so it will reveal the structure, okay? So the fundamental theorem uh, is telling us that the rank of the Hankel matrix is, is uh, the number of states of uh, weighted uh, finite tree automata that computes the function, okay? And this will, uh, so if we have a function over trees, okay? Um, it's the same theorem as before, okay? So if our function is computed by a, a, a finite weighted tree automata, then the, the Hankel matrix associated uh, with it, we're gonna have rank at most n, where n is the number of states of the automata. But the interesting uh, side of this theorem is the other one, that if we, ha if we happen to find a Hankel function, a Hankel matrix that has rank n, then there must exist a tree automata with n states that compute this function, okay? And this is, as before, this is the site that we're gonna use in order to uh, design a spectral algorithm that recovers this, um, this, this function, okay? So we suppose that we have the Hankel function, okay, indexed by outside trees and inside trees, and because it has rank n, okay, we can take, we can divide it into two, where this is the inner dimension here, and we can take this vector as the outside vector associated to this outside tree and the inside vector associated to this, okay? Uh, it has to, these equations need to hold. Uh, so this factorization of the, of the Hankel matrix gives us uh, these inside-outside maps, okay? If we go a step farther and consider the Hankel matrix specific to one specific symbol, okay? Uh, it needs to happen that any entry here, these are entries that we observe, needs to be the product of the outside vector of the outside tree, which we have from having factorized, times the matrix or tensor associated to this uh, symbol, times the cross product of the inside vectors associated to the trees, okay, which we have by the factorization we got, okay? Uh, so this means that, uh, if we can, if, so if we have uh, observations of Hankel matrix for a, for a particular symbol and we have uh, outside and inside maps, we can isolate the, the, the operators of the, mate, of, the, of the grammar, of the tree automata. So this is really analogous as before, okay? It all came by having this generalized uh, uh, notion of, of compositionality. Okay, so now let's see how we can apply uh, this to, to parsing, okay? I'm gonna present a couple of, of, uh, a couple of ways of formulating, of associating a tree automata to parse trees, okay? I'm not gonna go into uh, a lot of detail, okay? But, uh, okay, the intuition is just, so we can use it, do it the obvious way, okay? We have a parse tree here, so we have that the, our label tree that uh, our, the tree automata processes is just this derivation, okay? So we can associate a tree automata that recognizes this, uh, this syntactic derivations, okay? So um, actually, 
some questions here are, okay, we have this latent state, uh, tri this tree automata defines a latent state, okay? So one question is, what, is, what are the latent states associated with? So in one version that I will show, the, this latent state uh, can be thought of embeddings of words or phrases into an n-dimensional vector, okay? So compressions of strings into vectors, okay? Uh, another question that is relevant for parsing, and this is analogous to what, what I was discussing before with respect to string transactions, okay, is what kind of supervision do we learn from, okay? And here's when, where we're gonna have some difference with, with respect to EM, okay? So there's several scenarios in which we might uh, be interested in learning grammars. One is to have uh, full derivations, okay? This is the supervised uh, problem of learning a parser or a grammar, okay? So if we apply, uh, if, we, if we start with full derivations, uh, namely label trees, then what we obtain is a tree automata that is a latent variable grammar, okay? It's a PC, it can be seen as learning a PCFG with latent states, okay? Uh, we could also apply the method to learn from unlabeled trees, okay? Uh, Pereira and Chavez did one, one uh, application of that using EM. Uh, back in the 92, okay, so they, they have a strings with bracketings and then what the latent states learn is the, no, the, the nature of the, non, of, the no, of the non terminals, okay? So you are learning the, the symbols of the grammar in that case if you learn from, from unlabeled trees. And in the problem of unsupervised parsing where you only start, uh, you only have access to sentences then in this case, actually, it's so also known as grammar induction. In this case, you cannot apply, you will not be able to apply the spectral method straightforward, really, okay? Uh, unlike with EM, okay? So um, uh, that's because, again, so analogous to, to, to string transactions, you need to build this Hankel matrix, which this Hankel matrix is built by having a statistics of context-free cuts, of, of cuts of at least between inside and outside, okay? So if you only have sentences, you, can, you don't have a notion of where is the operation, the composition operations, okay? So it's not gonna be possible, even though there, are, there has been some, some solutions to this, okay? Okay, so let's see one version where, uh, uh, where so if we have a parse tree, we just, we just interpret the parse tree to be the, the trace of the tree where our automata that our automata processes, okay? So in, that in this case, uh, each terminal, each word, the automata will have a vector associated, okay? So this will be an n-dimensional an representation of Mary for our model, for place, for the, and for guitar, okay? So our model starts from some, say, lexical embeddings for each uh, word, okay? Then for each unary symbol that we observe, we have, uh, a matrix, and for each binary symbol uh, that in our in our grammars we have a tensor. Okay, so as before, uh, so this matrix here would take Mary and would generate a vector that represents N P Mary. Okay, and similarly for this binary production. Okay, so if we keep doing this bottom up, it's clear that uh, on top of each node we have a vector that represents the inside tree, okay? So our bottom-up computation is somehow computing um, n-dimensional embeddings of, of trees, okay? Of phrases, okay? And whenever we make the product <coughs> of this embedding with uh, the root weights, we get the value of our function, okay? So this would be the summary of the, of a tree automata on directly on parse trees, okay? So it would be a tuple of this kind working in some uh, n-dimensional space. We have uh, terminals and non-terminals of RIT1 and 2. By the way, these two sets, they don't need to be exclusive, okay? But what this would mean is that if we have, say, say that an NP can be uh, both unary and binary production, so this means that our model, so then for each of these, so the parameters of our model are the, the initial weights and a vector for each terminal, a matrix for each uh, unary non-terminal, and a tensor for each binary non-terminal, okay? So if a symbol can be both unary or, or 
we can participate in a unary or binary production, we just have one matrix and one, one tensor, okay? That's no, that, that is not a problem. It doesn't need to be a partition, okay? So, in this definition, it's nice to think that if we have a tree that we can decompose it into an outside and inside part, okay? Of course, this applies, so the function of our tree is the inner product. So we are learning a, a function in terms of an inner product that works on a, on a hidden space, okay? So it's nice to think what is this hidden space, okay? So from the inside side, okay? So this function is taking any subtree, okay? And computing n-dimensional embeddings of the inside tree, okay? So, so uh, if, if the grammar, say, say the grammar is, the, the automata is probabilistic, then uh, it will map two trees to the same vectors if they happen to be replaceable. Okay, so it's an embedding that uh, should be capturing replaceability, okay? While the outside function maps outside trees to n-dimensional vectors, so two, outside, two different outside trees will be mapped to a different vector if we can plug in the same type of arguments, okay? So clearly, uh, these kind of uh, models seem to be so these properties seem to be very useful for NLP if we want to capture notions of syntactic, semantic replicability, okay? Although there is a, uh, there is a lot still to be learned, uh, to be done uh, in this field, okay? So let me briefly talk, and uh, uh, with this I will finish this part, uh, on, a, on a, an alternative way of defining a tree automata for parse trees, okay? And in order to do that, so here I have a parse tree but with every parse tree, I can associate another tree, which I'm gonna call the production parse tree, okay? So it's a tree that has a node for each production, okay? So this top production here, S goes to NPVP, so I get a node here, and then this has two children, okay? Uh, and big, so for this edge here, I have this node here, and for this edge here, I have the node here. So we clearly we can translate uh, any tree to any production tree, okay? So the production tree is actually uh, representing the sequence, it's not a sequence, the operations, the tree of operations that uh, we follow, that a context-free grammar would follow in order to generate something like that derivation, okay? So instead of associating a tree automata here, we can associate it here, okay? So, so now, if we associate uh, a tree automaton here, we would have that, we have an operator associated with every node, so we would have an operator with, associated with every context-free production, okay? So, um, operators in this grammar, so namely matrices and tensors, are associated with unary or binary productions, okay? In this case, because we're operating here, there are some constraints, okay? So, this composition, so if we, choose to decompose this tree by this outside tree and this inside tree, we can only plug them together as long as this node is the same, okay? So uh, together with this representation, there are some constraints on which kind of trees, inside trees, which we can compose with the other ones, okay? So uh, the effect that this has is that the latent states associated to our automata are actually uh, refinements of each non-terminal of the grammar, okay? Uh, so this tree, the automata operating on these trees will learn a separate and dimensional space for each non-terminal, okay? Each non-terminal will have its own uh, vector space that defines an inner product, okay? So this class of uh, weighted automata is interesting because if we just work with uh, the dimension being one, we get the classic uh, PCFGs, okay, that have, so in this case, they, they would have one tensor of dimension one for each node, which means one scalar weight, so we would have one weight for each production, okay? So we get, we, we recover the, the classic uh, weighted context-free grammars. And we allow, if we allow the model to learn uh, more hidden dimensions, then we get this uh, latent annotated uh, probabilistic context-free grammar, okay, which was proposed some years ago uh, by Matsusaki and Petrov, and they made very nice models using EM, and recently uh, Cohen and colleagues have been using it 
to, uh, to f with have been trained uh, grammars like that using spectral methods also with very interesting results. And as a matter of fact, the paper that is presented here for uh, synchronous grammar for translation follows this uh, notion of associating uh, operators of the grammar to tree productions, okay? So in general, uh, a spectral learning of tree automata gives us kind of uh, a, a nice generalization from strings that we believe is quite natural, and it, it kind of makes us think of a framework in by which we can uh, define compositional functions and associate uh, weighted models for them. Uh, that these models mimic the compositional nature of, of, our, of our functions. So I think that uh, the same ideas can be used in order to, to define maybe models that, are, uh, that, that have a more linguistic um, motivation behind uh, with respect to those operations, but we still can define a compositional process like that, okay? So if we have such a notion of compositionality, then it should be possible to define a spectral learning algorithm uh, that works analogous to that. Um, so with that, we're gonna change to the last topic. Uh, if there are questions related to um, this block related to grammars, yeah? Um, how would you compare this model to the Cauchy neural network about how can computers and vacuum powders of trees? Uh, there are similarities uh, with, with uh, latent state models uh, trained with, with, um, with neural networks. Um, um, so in neural networks, they have also some sort, so people have defined models that have, that keep mapping every inside tree to some n-dimensional vector and embedding, okay? Uh, one difference is that with our definitions here, so the mappings, so the, the, the operators associated to each production are always linear. They, they take a form of a, of a matrix or a tensor, okay? While in neural networks, sometimes nonlinearities are introduced in that process, okay? So the, the consequences of that uh, are unknown to us. We don't, we don't understand well what is the consequence of that, okay? Uh, certainly the fact that they are linear, that we associate linear operators to each uh, node in the, in the automata makes it possible to have then this notion of Hankel matrix and the composition, okay? Because it's, we are all, we are, we stay in the, in the, in the, in the class of linear uh, functions operating in some hidden representation. Whenever you put nonlinearities, you probably lose that, okay? In the neural network uh, literature for this kind of models, there's been some, I think that there's been some experiments where maybe they change the, they change the, the composition function to be linear or nonlinear, okay? So maybe we should look at, the, at, those, at those experiments to see whether those nonlinearities can be important. But I don't, I don't have those results at hand. Okay, so maybe we can move to the last part. Okay, so I hope that by now you're all convinced that we can apply spectral learning whenever we have a Hankel matrix and that the notion of Hankel matrix can be used for string computations and tree computations. So what I want to do next is talk about what happens when we are in a setting where the Hankel matrix is straightforward to or infer. And I will do that in the setting of strings, but it's not a big restriction. Okay? So, so the main idea is how are we going to apply this, this framework, this uh, pipeline, the Hankel trick, when the function we want to learn is not a probability distribution. So that in order to estimate the Hankel matrix, we cannot make use counts from our data. 
And examples are, 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 I mean, you can find examples everywhere. So if you want to apply this framework to learn a classifier over strings, or you want to make real valued predictions, or you want to have, uh, for example, a scorings uh, for tagging which have non-probabilistic interpretation, say like, I don't know, you want to learn using a max margin framework. So let's begin with a simple example. In the case when we were learning a probability distribution over strings, well, we had our sample. We uh, computed the empirical distribution and took the Hankel matrix of the empirical distribution as the input to our spectral learning algorithm. So from here, all we did was just factorize this matrix using SBD and solve the equations to recover the weighted automata. But now, what happens if we are in uh, a more general regression setting where the examples are uh, strings again, but each string comes with a real label. Well, if each string comes with a real label, we can again infer or try to come up with the Hankel matrix of the function for which we have some examples, but there will be missing entries. I mean, the Hankel matrix has to be rectangular. There's no <laughs> work around for that. SPD works on matrices. And whenever you fix some prefixes and suffixes, two things can happen. I mean, you can have like missing entries or you can restrict yourself to a very, very small Hankel matrix. So if you don't want to restrict yourself to a small Hankel matrix, you need to put something in here before you can compute the SVD. And, and the, the important observation is that this, a similar thing happened when we, were used, when we were learning probability distributions, but in that case, putting a zero there is what makes the most sense because the empirical probability of this uh, string BB is zero, and if we haven't observed it in a, in a large sample, this is not a large sample, but if we don't observe BB in a large sample, then it's, it's safe to assume that the probability of BB is zero or is close to zero. On the other hand, here, we have no a priori knowledge of this type. Like, why would you put a zero here instead of a 3.5? So, so we would like to be able to fill these entries and then apply the spectral learning. And that would give us a, a method which is more general, where which we can learn weighted automata for more general tasks than just probability distributions. And, and the first question we might ask is why is it at all possible to fill these entries in a principled way? I mean, why would you expect that you are able to fill these entries if you haven't observed? And, and uh, and the main idea is, again, this, this fact that the weighted automata and the rank of the Hankel matrix are related. So this, the number of states of the weighted automata is related to the rank of the Hankel matrix. So <clears throat> that means that we would like to fill these entries in a way that the Hankel matrix has low rank. And, and this is possible because even if the matrix has size n times m, you actually only need n plus m times r coefficients to represent such a matrix. This is what the SVD tells us. Okay? So actually, we don't need information about the n times m, mat m entries to know the matrix. There's the amount of information in this matrix is n plus m, not n times m. So, so somehow, there's a hope there that if we have some entries, like say of this order, we might be able to recover uh, a Hankel matrix with low rank that will allow us to apply the spectral method. So, so that will have many applications, and in particular, it will have applications to some of the of the problems that Xavier was mentioning, where the kind of supervision that we have is not the supervision that the spectral method can take. So, for example, think about when we were talking about transductions where we don't have the alignments. So there we have a lot of information, but it's not the information of the entries of the Hankel matrix. Or think about uh, when we want to do grammar inference, where we have yields, but we don't have the parse trees. We have information about the Hankel matrix somehow, but we don't have the entries of the Hankel matrix. So there are many information models one can consider. The simplest one is when we know some of the entries of the Hankel matrix. So the first case, we know a subset of entries of the Hankel matrix. Or we know linear measurements of the Hankel matrix. So we don't know anything about the entries of H, 
but we know something about the entries of H when we uh, multiply them by a set of vectors B. Or we can have bilinear measurements, which is actually a, a, a general case of the subset of entries. So subset of entries is just bilinear measurements when U and V are indicator vectors. Or maybe we don't know anything about the entries, like the values of the entries, but we have constraints between the entries. We know that some string should have higher uh, value than some other string because we are in, say, in a max margin setting where we want, like, some, like, some, say, some tagging to have higher score than some other tagging. And of course, we can also have noisy versions of all the above. Okay, so this. If we are able to solve this type of problems, like learn a uh, Hankel matrix from this kind of information, we will be able to apply the spectral method in more general settings. Uh, and also, this is a place where you can put a priori information you, ha you have about this function, about your Hankel matrix. So the, the very, simple thing, very simple things we know about the Hankel matrix is that the entries have to satisfy some constraints, uh, equality constraints. You can also have uh, constraints about the entries, say that you want the entries to be uh, smaller than, than some given value C. You know that the matrix that you, when you fill the entries, it should have low rank, but you can also have other types of information about your function. So this is a, this is a uh, framework that would allow you to, to, to put this, um, this uh, prior knowledge into, into the game when you learn the Hankel matrix. So now I'm just going to focus on, on this, uh, this first case here, when we know a subset of entries of the Hankel matrix. But I mean, some of these have been looked at. Some is just open problems, how to deal with them. But I think all of them are interesting and, and feasible. So. How do we formalize the problem of finding a Hankel matrix that agrees with the data that we have when what we have is just a subset of the entries? And we're going to formalize this using, using the empirical risk minimization approach, which is something commonly used in machine learning. Okay? So the, the input data is a set of uh, n pairs of strings and real labels. So x will be strings and y's will be real labels. And, and in order to learn this Hankel matrix, we're given a set of parameters. We're given the rows of columns of our Hankel matrix. So some user will say, OK, I want to learn the Hankel matrix using this data, and I want to learn this particular subblock on these prefixes and suffixes. The user is, can also give us some loss function, and, and preferably a convex loss function, that we will use to compare two real numbers, which we think of them as two labels. So one of them will be labels in our data. The other will be the labels in our Hankel matrix. And we want to have a loss that says how, if depending on how close these numbers are, what are the loss that we suffer. And then we'll also have either a regularization parameter or a rank bound. And this will uh, help us try to find a Hankel matrix that agrees with the data and also has low rank, which will act as a regularizer because we'll uh, guarantee that in the end the spectral method will produce a weighted automata with a small number of states. So, so there's basically two different formulations. They are uh, almost identical. So the first formulation is a constraint formulation. So we, will f we want to find a Hankel matrix, so that's an A, H, uh, over the space of matrices on P and S, which has to satisfy the Hankel constraint. So there will be some equality constraints here, which minimizes the uh, mm, average empirical loss. Okay, So we will take the sum multiplied by 1 over n of the losses that we incur on our labels on the data and the entries of our Hankel matrix. And we want the Hankel matrix to have long, rank less than r. Or we can also have a regularized formulation where we substitute this rank constraint for a regularization term. So now we want to minimize this joint loss function uh, where the second term also tries to impose a low rank constraint. But of course, 
this is hard to solve because minimizing the rank or uh, solving convex optimizations with rank constraints is NP hard. And so what do we do? Well, we do what people in machine learning do. We, uh, we rely to some convex relaxations of the rank function. So the most natural one in this setting uh, is the nuclear norm. So the nuclear norm of a, of a matrix is denoted by this uh, norm star and is the sum of the singular values of the matrix. And, and in machine learning, as I said, people use this norm as a, as a convex surrogate for the rank and it has lots of properties which I, I will not talk about. But the important thing is that this is a convex function of the matrix. So if we go to our regularized formulation, for uh, the learning the Hankel matrix and we substitute the rank function by the nuclear norm, we end up with this problem, which when the loss function is convex, this is a convex optimization problem. And convex optimization problems are nice because we know how to solve them in polynomial time. We know that there's a unique uh, global optimum and, and then, um, that's nice. <laughs> So uh, I won't go into detail on how one solves this optimization. First, because there's a lot of choices. Second, because it will probably depend on your loss function, which opt optimizer you will end up choosing. But I will just uh, tell you that there's several ways to solve nuclear norm regularized problems. So you can use uh, proximal or projected subgradient algorithms. There's also uh, Frank Wolf or, or like uh, conditional gradient descent algorithms developed recently. There's also a singular value thresholding. And of course, you can also use uh, non-convex optimization algorithms if you're uh, willing to give up on the global optimum condition. And in particular, there's some, some alternating minimization approaches where you represent H as a product of, of two matrices, P and S, which guarantee that the, that the output is low rank. And in general, they are heuristic, but there are also some guarantees in some cases where you can show that if your initial point is a good one, you end up learning, uh, converging to the global optimum. Okay. So this has found some applications recently, and I think uh, most of them Xavier talked about. So this is a sequence tagging problem where instead of learning uh, join or conditional distribution of input given output, no, of output given input, sorry, uh, you can also use the spectral method for learning uh, sequence tagging in a max margin setting using the spectral learning. We presented this in ICML this year. And there's also um, applications of this Hankel matrix completion problem to unsupervised transducers and unsupervised context-free grammars. And, and that's it. That part is really short. <laughs> uh, so the, mm, I want to conclude now, and maybe we have time for some discussion and questions, but I think that the, that the main take-home points of the tutorial are that spectral methods are an alternative approach to learn compositional functions uh, by means of algebraic operations instead of other like uh, iterative methods like EM or split merge. And that the, the key idea, the key idea is this use of the Hankel matrix, which is and factorizations of the Hankel matrix, which is provided by these forward, backward, or inside outside recursions. So whenever you have a computation that you can partition and, and this partition gives uh, a, low, a low rank factorization of a Hankel matrix, you can ideally apply these type of methods. And it's applicable to, to a wide range of formalisms, fine state automaton, transducers, context-free grammars, maybe more synchronous grammars and so on. And, and it's nice that in, in the end, when, when you have a weak supervision, you end up making these connections to, to matrix completion and empirical risk minimization so that you can import a lot of ideas from that have been recently developed in machine learning to try to solve these methods. But this is, this is really the, the frontier. This is where all the open problems of these methods lie. Uh, so that's it. I think we have plenty of time for, well, 20 minutes for questions, discussion, or I don't know. Singular values 
of the Henkel matrix and how hard it was to learn an HMA, mm -hmm. such that it was easier if the singular values were larger. Yeah. And then here, when you're minimizing the nuclear norm, what you're trying to do is minimize the singular values. So does this mean that this approach is looking for a Henkel matrix that is harder to learn? Or okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that's uh, apparently an innocuous question, but it <laughs> I think it's a, it's a really good point. So the intuition here um, is that the nuclear norm is the L1 norm of the singular values. And, and in machine learning, there's this, uh, there's this, like there's theoretical results and intuitions that say that minimizing the L1 norm induces a sparsity. Okay, so that if you're minimizing an L2 norm, you will try, so an L2 regularizer will try to make all your weights equal, and an L1, an L1 regularizer will try to make as, as many uh, weights zero as possible. So the idea is that if you're minimizing this, this norm, you will make as many singular values uh, zero as possible, and that will, uh, will promote low rank solutions. But of, of course, there's, there's this, uh, there's this there's this result that says that in the case of, of learning a probabilistic automata or an HMM, uh, the models that are hard to learn are the ones for which the smaller singular value is very small. Now, the thing is that uh, in, in for, this for this type of approaches, we have less theoretical results. But what I would do in practice is you, you set a value for your regularization parameter you learn your matrix, and this, ma this Hankel matrix, that's the output of this optimization, will have some rank. And maybe the, this, the smaller singular values are very small. So when you compute the SVD, you can throw them away. And they won't contribute much. They will, in, in, intuitively, they will correspond to like a stage which have very low frequency or contribute very little to your function. So you can still throw them away, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a subtle point. Yeah. How sensible is that formulation to your regularization parameter? Like, can you just set any, any parameter to that, or do you like, change it slightly, you like break things up? Oh, yeah, that's also a question. I don't have results for that, but there, there, there are some. Uh, these things tend to be quite robust around a given range. So the, a lot of theoretical results show that, that the right range for your parameter should be usually like roughly one over square root of n. And so, so a, a good uh, rule of thumb to choose lambda is to like put one over square root of n and multiply it by different constants, say what, 10 to the minus three to 10 to the three. And, and find where in this range is, is your good regularization parameter. And also you can have like a more coarse grain search first to limit the range and then do a, a fine grain search. Does this relate to their choice of uh, practice expertise as well? Like if you choose a, like a larger angle matrix, can you get more robust? Hmm. I don't think we have done like enough experiments to to conclude anything about this but usually in these cases so so this optimization even though it's convex is is computationally expensive so so in the vanilla spectral method where you estimate the Hankel matrix by counts you can deal with very large sets of prefixes and suffixes when you have to solve this optimization problem uh, it's a good idea to try to keep your matrix as small as possible for computational reasons. I mean, if you could, if you have enough time, yeah, then go and optimize. So, my question is both on the last question, uh, like Hankel is narrow and Hankel is very narrow. Uh, is it possible to get a lot of different results where, like, for example, the statistics that you're doing is a selection? Uh, no, 
I mean, these, these results, these are kind of one, two years old, and uh, the, this optimization is quite involved. So we're at the frontier. This is where, like, we're working now, and, and probably a lot of people in, in NLP would, should try these methods in different settings. And I think it would be really helpful to get feedback and, and, and see these methods working in, dif in different settings. And probably the right parameters will differ from setting to setting. So uh, I'm a theoretician and, <laughs> and Xavier. Yeah, that's, uh, we get that asked a lot, I guess. So there's a paper we did in 2012 where we started with the basic spectral algorithm for, uh, for probabilistic automata. And, okay, this. So, okay. So, we wanted to replace this step and this step with an optimization problem in order to try to understand this question precisely. What is the, the loss that's optimizing this method? And, and we came up with, a, with an answer which uh, is, I think it's a partial answer. 
and, and to get to this answer, what you need to do is first you look at the SBD, and the SBD is actually solving some optimization. So SBD, when you do truncated SBD, you're trying to find, uh, you can look at it at, from two points of view. You're either trying to find a low rank approximation of your Hankel matrix, but that doesn't help much. What helps a little bit more is to, okay, yeah, I don't have good equations for this. Yeah, let's look at this. So, wh so when we plug the output of the SVD decomposition in this equation, okay, so, so we can write this P and S in terms of the B, the singular vectors. Okay, uh, so, so when you plug these singular vectors in here, you end up with uh, something that looks like a, a Frobenius norm minimization. So you, you can minimize the, the Frobenius norm of H times B times H sigma times B. So you want to find a B that minimizes uh, the difference between this and A sigma times, uh, times B again. But I don't find this answer very satisfying. In a sense, it says that uh, you're trying to find uh, a weights that, um, that are good at making one-step predictions under some L2-like norm. But I think that, that the, the better intuition is to think of this like in, in statistics when you want to learn a statistical model you can do maximum likelihood. Okay? You, can, you have your data, you define your likelihood function, and, and the, your parameters appear in there, and you can try to optimize uh, the likelihood of your data. But there's an older, an older principle in statistics, which is called the method of moments, which says that if you have a family of distributions, and you have equations for the moments of this distribution, you can also take your data and compute your empirical moments, and you want to find parameters that give you a uh, distribution in this family whose moments equal the moments that you compute from your data. And, and this principle is defined in terms of equality. Okay, so you want to find a model that whose uh, moments are equal to the moments of your distribution. And, and then what we're doing here, we're doing a regularized method of moments. Because if we did just the method of moments, we would end up with a weighted automata that has the same number of states as the rank of your empirical Hankel matrix whose rank might be very, very big. But most of this rank is given, to, is given to no, due to the noise. So we regularize these moments and then solve the method of moments. But it's not a loss optimization, what we're doing. The method as it is works better with fully connected machines, but there's two places where you can put uh, your, where you could try to enforce your prior knowledge. One is like when you're like estimating your Hankel matrix, like we did in here, you could of course add another regularizer to this optimization. Uh, so if you have extra knowledge about your function, how your Hankel matrix should, should look like, you could add another term here, and if it's convex, you're, you're okay. Uh, but that's not about the machine, that's about the function. If you want to impose knowledge about the machine, you can, well, one way we know how to do that, but uh, I think it's just one way. There might be other ways, and, and that's a, I think that's uh, a very interesting open problem. One way you can do that 
is in, in this paper I was mentioning, 2012 ICML with Xavier and Arianna, where we try to study this uh, formulation in terms of a loss of, of the spectral method. We then took this initial formulation in terms of Frobenius uh, norm and, and give a convex relaxation of it. So we end up with a convex problem and we are learning the automata by solving a convex optimization. Okay? So in there, you could also add uh, other uh, regularizing terms to this convex optimization that uh, impose knowledge on your, on about the machine. The problem is that the only way we know how to do that right now, you end up with a weighted automata which has as many states as prefixes in your Hankel matrix. So you learn huge automatas. Uh, you can, like, you could impose the prior knowledge there, but then ideally when you get the automata you would minimize it and you would lose this structure. So, yeah, it's, it's the best we have right now. But 
for two reasons is that if they apply the spectral method of the shell, which doesn't work, if they start uh, doing all these things, they get it up to the performance that is better than, than uh, the end. Uh, similar thing can be seen in the, hmm. in the results of this uh, extension procedure as well, where the comparison with the end is covered all. Yeah. This thing about the, the negative weights that you mentioned, this is, is, is a little bit related to this limitation. So because if we are given a weighted automata, we cannot tell whether it's going to predict positive numbers for all strings. Uh, what we end up learning sometimes produces negative numbers for some of the strings, even though we're trying to learn a probability distribution. And, and that is not a problem in general because this function will be close to a probability distribution. But if your evaluation metric depends on, on like it's something that has logarithms in it, it's some kind of perplexity or likelihood or something like that, of course, y you cannot evaluate it if it generates negative numbers. So what they say is whenever you get a negative number, take the absolute value. And, and the intuitive reason for that is that, uh, is that taking the absolute value of this multiplication of vectors and numbers might not give you the right probability, but it will be of the right order of magnitude of what the probability should have been. Because you've, you've multiplied uh, uh, several matrices, and the, the amount of matrices you multiply somehow relates to the order of magnitude. So taking the absolute value is a good mm, way to deal with that. I mean, once the probability is zero, it's zero is still like the logarithm of zero is, is minus infinity. And, and if you, rep like you could replace it with, uh, say, the machine epsilon, like the smallest value you can represent. But then you, you would do that even if the string has length 1 or the string has length 100. And you want something that depends on, on, on the string because the, the probability will, the order of magnitude of that probability will have something to do with the length of the string. So that's why the absolute value works. Oh, yeah, so, so when you move to reals to finite fields, you don't have SBD anymore. When you move from finite fields to arbitrary semi-rings, there's no notion of rank of matrices anymore. So it's, it's not clear how you can multiply two matrices. So what are the, de the right decompositions of matrices? I know there's some people working on like factorizations of matrices with entries in semi-rings, but it's pretty esoteric. Uh, no, no, because if you could solve this, you would you would be able to solve this, and this is undecidable. This reader. Yeah, so let's suppose that uh, your A is uh, is non-negative, okay, and so therefore A of n is non-negative. Yeah. So you have to find the probability of multiplying positive. Mm -hmm. So you're asking whether we can normalize it? Yeah, so some kind of uh, transformation. So if you can find it, so <coughs> probably not just a standard normalization, right? Mm -hmm. My question is uh, whether, uh, I, I think it, it, there is a disequilibrium result, but I'm not completely sure about it. Because if, if that is true, you can try to impose that your matrix A is non negative as a constraint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think in, in this case you, you can. The, the problem is that in, in the basic method, trying to impose that the A's are, are non-negative feels a lot like finding a non-negative factorization of H, which is also uh, like, one, like one thing is if you're given the automata. The other thing is you want, if you want to use this idea for learning. If you want to use it for learning, probably you need to come up with a way to obtain a non-negative matrix factorization of H 
which is also a hard problem. And, and, and then you can also use this convex uh, optimization formalism for finding the automata that I was telling about. And in there, you can impose positivity easily. Uh, but as I said, then you end up having huge automata. And when you minimize them, probably they won't be positive. So. Thank you.